Good morning, Langdow Church. It's really good you've been able to join our webcast this morning. What I'd like to do as we begin is to turn to the Bible and we're going to look at Mark chapter 8, verse 11 to 33. Mark chapter 8, verse 11 to 33. I'm going to read that just now. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given it. Then he left them, got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it's because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus said to them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? They came to Bethsaida and some people brought a, ma a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't even go into the village. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Well, may God bless that reading to us as Barry comes and preaches in just a moment. But before we do that, we're going to sing together. Thank you. 
John Newton began his old hymn with the familiar words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Stuart Townend began his more modern hymn with similar words. Once I was blind, yet believed I saw everything, proud in my ways, yet a fool in my part, lost and alone in the company of multitudes, life in my body, yet death in my heart. The theme of spiritual blindness is a familiar theme not only in the hymnody of the church, but also in the scriptures of the church as well, and particularly in Mark's gospel. In this passage alone, we see the blindness of the Pharisees, the blindness of the disciples, the blindness of a man from Bethsaida, and the blindness of of Simon Peter. And by considering what uh, the passage has to say to us about their blindness, we can come to a better understanding of the spiritual blindness which so often characterizes our own day and time, and also, sadly, even at times, our own hearts and minds. So let's uh, keep our Bibles open uh, in front of us and let's uh, look together at this passage. Now we uh, begin uh, with verses uh, 11 to 13 with the blindness of the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees have come up again uh, from Jerusalem and they have begun to question Jesus. Now they were not questioning him because they were looking for answers. They were questioning him because they wanted to test him and to uh, catch him out in some way. They were asking him to give them a sign from heaven. Now, this is a bit rich because the very reason that they have come up from uh, Jerusalem uh, to Galilee is because they have heard about the many signs and wonders of uh, which he has performed. And they themselves earlier in Mark's gospel had seen uh, with their own eyes uh, the signs and wonders that he uh, performed. Uh, they are uh, asking uh, not for evidence to uh, increase their faith, uh, but they are looking for evidence uh, to bolster their suspicions that Jesus is not who he claims to be and that the people uh, should realize this and should stop following him immediately. Well, the, the scripture says that Jesus sighed deeply and said that he would not give uh, this generation a sign, no sign, he said, will be given to these people. Because the reality was, these people were spiritually blind. And it didn't matter how many signs and wonders he performed. They still, though they had eyes, they couldn't see. And though they had ears, they couldn't hear. And though they had uh, hearts, they uh, couldn't receive and believe the message concerning uh, who Jesus 
was. And even if he were to uh, die and be uh, buried and raised from the dead, uh, they uh, still uh, would not believe. And so he left them. He left them. He got in to the boat and crossed to the other side. He left them. They were spiritually blind. And it didn't matter what he said. It didn't matter what he did. They would not see. But sadly... This text makes clear to us uh, that it was not only the Pharisees who were blind, but also the disciples. After they've gotten into the boat, as they're making their way uh, to the other side, uh, they realize that they have forgotten to bring bread. Now, this shouldn't have been a problem at all. Because just a few chapters earlier, they had seen Jesus feed a crowd of 5,000 men with 12 baskets full left over. Uh, just earlier in this chapter, they had seen uh, the Lord Jesus feed a crowd of 4,000 people with seven baskets full left over over. They had one loaf for the 13 people on the boat and a sea full of fish around them. Food should not have been an issue at all because the Lord Jesus Christ was with them in the boat. God in human flesh was with them in the boat. And whether they had one loaf of bread or none, it should have been no issue whatsoever. Even Satan would say in the wilderness of temptation, you are able to take these stones and cause them to become bread. Here they have a loaf of bread and they actually doubted and questioned whether or not the Lord Jesus Christ was able to provide for their needs. Why is this? It's because though they had eyes, they didn't see. Though they had ears, they didn't hear. And though they had hearts, they had not yet fully understood and properly responded to the message of who Jesus was and why Jesus had come that's why in the course of this uh, encounter, he asked of them nine different questions, just some of them. Uh, do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? Do you still not understand? You see, He's dealing with the disciples here in the boat at sea and their problem was spiritual blindness. I want to remind you as we uh, are now moving uh, into uh, new phases of the present global pandemic that our Lord Jesus Christ is with us in the boat. Uh, there's no need for us to be fearful, uh, no need for us to be uh, fretful, uh, no need for us to be nervous, uh, apprehensive, uh, questioning among ourselves uh, what's going to happen, uh, how are our needs going to be met, and is everything going to turn out all right? Surely by now we understand better than that. Surely by now. Our eyes have been opened, our ears have been opened to the reality that God is in Christ, in us, and that because he is with us in this situation, we need not fear. We can have confidence that whatever our God does is right, 
and that he has plans and purposes and they are good and he will unfailingly and unerringly accomplish them even in these present circumstances. The blindness of the Pharisees, the blindness of the disciples. And now they finally reach the other side of the sea. They come to a place called Bethsaida. And there were some people there who brought a blind man to Jesus. This seems to be uh, the recurring theme of this portion of Mark's gospel. And they begged Jesus to touch him. Jesus, we are told, took the blind man by the hand, led him outside the village. He spat on the man's eyes. He put his hands on him. And Jesus said, do you see anything? Now, at this point, we would expect him to say, I once was blind, but now I see. I now see everything. But that's not how he responds. He responds by saying, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. And so once more, uh, Jesus will put uh, his hands on the man's eyes. And the man's uh, eyes will be uh, opened and his sight is restored. And he saw everything clearly. Question. Why is it that Jesus had to have another go? Uh, Why is it that this man was not healed immediately and instantaneously? Of his blindness. I want you to realize it was not because of any deficiency in the divine power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why he could have healed him of his blindness even without spitting in his eyes, even without uh, touching him. Uh, He could have just said the word. Why is it that it has happened in this way? Because though this is a historical account of of factual uh, events, uh, we need to take note of the fact that these verses serve actually as a parable, because this is about physical blindness, to help us understand the way the Lord deals with spiritual blindness. The reality is we are not delivered from spiritual blindness Generally speaking, not all at once. It's something that takes place incrementally, progressively, over time, little by little. That was certainly the case here. In the first instance, he he saw people and they looked like trees walking uh, around. But when Jesus put his hands on his eyes a second time. His eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Amazing account. And so we've seen the blindness of the Pharisees, the blindness of the disciples, and the blindness of this man at Bethsaida. Now we need to consider the blindness of, of Peter, because we are told that leaving Bethsaida, uh, they went on to the villages around uh, Caesarea uh, Philippi. And as they were journeying, Jesus asked them, "Um, who do people see me to be? Uh, Who do people say that I am? What is their viewpoint? How do they see it? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Uh, Still others uh, think that perhaps you're one of the other prophets. And Jesus said, but what do you see? And who do you say I am? And Peter answered with great confidence and assurance. You are 
the Messiah. Absolutely amazing. Finally, here is someone who has eyes to see. Here is someone among the disciples who knows who Jesus really is. In, in Matthew's uh, extended account of the same uh, incident, Jesus said, blessed are you. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. You see, that is our only hope of spiritual sight. That is our only hope of being cured of spiritual blindness. That, that God Himself would open our eyes and that the Spirit of God would give us eyes that see and ears that hear and hearts that are ready to receive and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So now... Um, Peter knows everything. He, he sees everything clearly. Not so fast. For Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. That he must be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. That he must be killed. And then after three days, rise again. He spoke very plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter here is just like that blind man at Bethsaida who the Lord revealed something to him and he began to see. But he's still not seeing as clearly as he needs to see. Yes, he's come to understand who Jesus is and that's what the first half of Mark's Gospel is all about. But he's not yet begun to fully understand why Jesus has come. And so his uh, restoration of his sight, his Recovery from spiritual blindness is going to be progressive, incremental, bit by bit, little by little. Not so much like a flip switch, which when flipped, floods the room with light, more like a dimmer switch, which slowly but surely, little by little, dispels the darkness and replaces it with light. This is the blindness of the Pharisees, the, the blindness of the disciples, the blindness of the man at Bethsaida, and even the blindness of Simon Peter. I wonder if uh, listening to this uh, webcast this morning there are those who likewise are spiritually blind. You have seen many things, but yet do not perceive. You have heard many things, but yet do not understand. What is the problem? The problem is not with those who are seeking to help you see, nor is it with those who are attempting to help you to hear. You have spiritual blindness and spiritual deafness, which is a consequence of the fall of man and is evidence of the continuing sinfulness of man. Your only hope is that God in mercy would touch your eyes and cause you to see. You may be like uh, Saul of Tarsus 
who though he was blind, believed he saw everything and was going with great zeal to arrest and bring into judgment all who were followers of the way in Damascus. He had to lose his physical sight there on the road to Damascus. He had to be blinded physically in order to gain spiritual sight concerning who Jesus was and why Jesus had come. And he then would be sent to the Gentiles according to his own testimony to cause those who had blinded eyes to be able to see. I may also be uh, speaking to some people today who, yes, you have come to see some things, some essential things, some very important things. But because you can see some things, you uh, assume that you can see everything. And you may even find yourself uh, sitting in judgment on the word of God and saying, oh, that's not right. Or are questioning or in effect uh, rebuking the Lord Jesus Christ saying, no, 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 it, it, it couldn't be that way because I've seen this. We need the Lord Jesus Christ to continue through the entrance of his word to bring light to our darkened hearts and minds so that we can understand increasingly what his word says and what his word means to us. Now we see dimly. Only then will we see clearly when we see him face to face. May the Lord help you. May he help me to recognize the dangers of spiritual blindness. And may we, like this man of Bethsaida, listen to those who have sight and follow them as they bring us to Jesus. That he might heal us of our spiritual blindness and enable us to see him for who he really is and to accept him for all that he has done on our behalf.
It's a lovely hymn, and the reason it's a lovely hymn is because the words are true, and we're taught in Scripture that we uh, admonish and we instruct one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So, Father, we thank you that you have reminded us that whate'er you do is right. Give us eyes to see this and give us hearts to believe this. And in those times when our sight is dim, may we look to you and may we receive from you that touch that we need so that we might see. And in those times when the storm clouds gather and darkness is all around us and we find it so very difficult to see anything at all, help us to continue to see you through the eyes of faith and help us to look forward to that day when we will see you, not through the eyes of faith, but we will see you face to face. Lord, hasten that day for our Savior's sake. Amen.